Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today is a special day. It's our 250th episode. And to mark this milestone, we decided to talk about some of our favorite career-related episodes with Sadie Jones, who has actually conveniently joined us for many of those episodes. Your Law School Toolbox host today is Allison Monahan, and typically I'm with Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. Together, we're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website, Career Dicta. I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today is our 250th episode. Crazy. And to mark this milestone, we've decided to talk about some of our favorite career-related podcasts, many of which have been with the amazing Sadie Jones, ex-big law recruiter and all-around career expert. So welcome, Sadie, and thanks for joining us all those times along the way. Thanks for having me back. It's definitely been a journey. Um, all right. Well, when we were going over episodes for this podcast, we sort of realized, you know, a lot of these are kind of in a few big buckets. And I think, obviously, that's because these are the buckets people tend to be really concerned about as law students. So some of these buckets, we have tons of stuff people can listen to if they have questions or concerns. So we're going to group them for you. And then, you know, you can dive into the individual episodes. Well, first off, probably the biggest question most people have is about resumes, cover letters, and other application materials. Why do you think people are always so concerned about this? Well, I think it's sort of the requirement for any job. Right. Uh, So no matter what you're applying for, that's usually sort of the first thing you need to submit. And so you want to make sure that you're sort of putting your best foot forward and doing what you need to do. And maybe some people don't want to do more than they have to do. Uh, so it's sort of that balance. Right. I think we get a lot of questions. Do I really need a cover letter? You know, do I have to have different resumes for different jobs and all of these kind of things? We answer for you. Um, so here's a quick list um, that some of you might want to check out. We have podcast 12, which is resume and cover letter basics. Some of these were pre Sadie. Um, 111, which I believe you're on, which is resumes and cover letters. 127, which is about avoiding resume no-goes. I'm pretty sure we did that one based on resumes we get. <laughs> um, <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. We get, a, you know, people do apply to work with us and we see a lot of resumes and there are definitely some things we would prefer you did not do. So if you ever plan to apply to work with us, please review that episode first. Um, we also have 173, which is frequently asked questions um because we get a lot of questions too and we've got some answers uh 237 is pretty interesting that is handling resume and cover letter difficulties and you know i think there are kind of these recurring topics that appear that people are concerned about so if you you know are worried about your resume or your cover letter definitely listen to that one um yeah i mean do you have any sort of super basic resume advice other than I guess our big one don't have typos yeah that's always the you know top piece of advice is review your resume many times have different people read it over make sure that there you know is nothing wrong with it uh also a big one is remember to submit it as a pdf I feel like that's something I keep seeing still happening and um so that's something else that I think is just really important and very easy and basic. Absolutely. I I agree completely. That drives me nuts when we get Word resumes and they don't, they're not, you know, the layout isn't right. The like font may be different on your computer versus my computer. You might have a Mac and, you know, someone else has a PC. Like there's just really no reason for that. So if you, if you take away one message from this, remove typos and make sure you submit in PDF format. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. In addition to resumes and cover letters, you might need a letter of recommendation. So if you do, you can listen to podcast 77. And that's about how to get great letters of recommendation for anything, because that can be really important, you know, particularly when maybe you're not seeing your professors as frequently or something like that. Um, All right. Well, let's move on to the next big bucket, which we have a ton of stuff on. I think I probably didn't even list them all because I don't want to bore people, but 
Uh, we do have a page on the website, uh, which you can go and has all of our career related topics. So, you know, we'll link to that in the show notes, but there are definitely tons and tons you could listen to. So let's talk about OCI briefly. So this is the on-campus interviewing process. Tell people just a tiny bit about this if they have no idea what we're talking about. So it's kind of an opportunity um, to put students um, together for first round interviews with, you know, law firms and other employers kind of in a set process where students bid on firms. Sometimes firms um, get to pick their students. Sometimes they're just assigned randomly. It's sort of this matching system. And, you know, it's sort of speed dating um, for interviews and you just kind of move along and, you know, it's usually over a week or two. Uh, it's kind of, you know, an intense process, but it's a way, you know, to meet lots of employers and employers meet lots of students all kind of in a, um, organized environment. Um, yeah. And so, you know, if people are not familiar with the OCI process, which definitely can be a little bit intimidating, I think um, we have some really early episodes from the podcast on mastering on-campus interviews. That's number three and number four, which are callback tips and callbacks are what you do after your first round of interview. Um, we also have a lot of later stuff, which is probably a little bit more relevant. Uh, number 55, which is an overview of big law on-campus interviewing. And 105, which I think is maybe the first one of these you joined us for, which is OCI Basics um, with an ex-Big Law recruiter. And we did another strategy episode, which is 140. So I think yeah, that one probably digs a little bit deeper. So if you need the basics, start with that. If you want more strategy around bidding and that kind of thing, check out the OCI strategy. We also have recently done one about OCI moving to the winter, which is 243. Um given the coronavirus situation. So that kind of throws a whole new wrinkle into this. Um, in addition, we've done a couple kind of post-OCI ones that I think are relevant. One about handling summer associate offers. So assuming you've gotten some offers. Um, and another one about no offer after OCI. So here's what to do. Um, those are 108 and 164. So those are kind of more you know, OCI didn't either did work out or didn't work out, what should you do? Um, any, any other thoughts around that? Uh, around OCI generally, I would say, you know, make sure that you're educated going into the process because it is probably different than anything you've ever done before. And so, like, I think the OCI strategy is great to kind of get an idea of, you know, going into it with a mindset, you know, and a plan in place for how you're handling it. Uh, and I think just kind of mentally prepare yourself for kind of how intensive it can be. Uh, you know, I think that'll, that'll go far to kind of prep yourself. Right. And, you know, I think in the end, you do the best you can. Some people do really well at OCI and it works out for them. And not everyone, you know, ends up with an offer, or ends up with a ton of callbacks. And I think either way, there's a way to move forward. But I think also OCI is an opportunity to kind of put your best foot forward and, you know, try to potentially get things sort of set earlier, you know, in the year so you won't be as stressed later still looking for a job. Right. It is definitely kind of a hit or miss process. I think particularly, you know, mm -hmm. when the economy gets weird, OCI gets really weird because firms aren't sure what they're doing and what they're going to need a couple of years down the road. So if you are going to be going through this process, uh, definitely be sure you know what you're getting into and that you've bidded on firms kind of strategically and not all reach firms and that kind of thing so that you hopefully will emerge with at least one offer. All right. Well, let's switch and talk about a different summer job hunt. So the OCI is your second summer, but you need to find a job your first summer. Um, so we have a couple of episodes, at least on that. Uh, 120, which is preparing for the 1L job hunt. And 232, which is about finding a 1L summer job in the spring. So talk about a, a little bit about the summer job hunt and the 1L situation. So uh, I actually think the 1L summer job hunt should not be nearly as stressful as the 2L or 3L summer job hunt because it is kind of an opportunity just to find something. Right. And so I know 1Ls, you know, do get stressed and this is all new to them and they're just getting through, you know, the start of law school. Uh, and so I think all of that's hard. But I really think it's important to go into it understanding that, 
There isn't some magical job that you need to get. And I don't know that it's super important that you have one thing over another thing as long as you find something that gives you legal experience that you'll be able to talk about um, for interviews for the following year. And, uh, you know, you make some connections. All of that stuff is great. Potentially, you know, you get a job in the city you want to be in. So I think that this is actually a lot less pressure than anything else you're going to probably have to go through. And I think that's, you know, the mindset to go into it with. Which is interesting because I'm pretty sure my biggest meltdown in law school over my career was about getting a 1L job. And I think I had that meltdown in about October when I couldn't even apply for anything. (laughs) So I believe that. That's why I really want to get to people early and remind them that that's not necessary. Yeah, I know. It was fine. I had plenty of options, most of which did not present themselves until like January or February. There was no reason for me to be in tears, like, you know, at the whatever it wasn't even career services because we couldn't talk to them at like the public interest law office because I didn't have a job yet. Um, yeah, I think, you know, you'll find something and it just needs to be legal related and it ideally should not be the biggest stressor in your law school life, but it probably exactly. will be at some point. <laughs> I agree. All right. So go listen to these episodes if you're you know, going to be doing this job search and hopefully it calms you down and gives you some direction. All right. Uh, our next big bucket is one we've actually been doing a number of recently that I think are really good and interesting on interviewing. So, you know, most people are probably going to have to do an interview to get a job. So it is probably secondarily as important as your resume and cover letter, you know, so that gets you in the door. But if you're going to get that job, you're probably going to have to talk to somebody. So we have um, episode 175 on some top interview questions that you have heard and are really interesting. And more recently, we've done a couple um, around specific types of interviews. So 241 is about virtual interviews, which people are seeing a lot more these days. Um, And one of our most recent episodes, 247, just a few ago, was actually on behavioral interviews. So I thought that one was really interesting because that's something that people can get really worked up to. Um, What do you think people need to be thinking about about around interviews, just generally speaking? I think that, you know, it's sort of a balance between practicing and feeling prepared and sort of having some set stories and having, you know, some idea of what, you know, your resume says and what, you know, your personal story is. And also not over preparing. So it sounds like you're giving these candy answers. Right, like a politician. uh, Because I think that's a real turnoff. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Um, So I know that's hard to say, like, you know, prepare, but don't prepare too much. (laughs) But um, what I would say is kind of maybe go into it writing down, um, you know, a few main points you want to hit. I wouldn't write them out as full sentences, so you're not repeating the sentences, Um, you know, and also make sure that you have some questions for them at the end. Uh, You know, those are the big things I would prepare. And yeah, I would just practice any opportunity to do a mock interview, especially if you're doing a virtual interview and you've never done that before. I would make sure to practice that ahead of time. And, you know, we talked a lot about kind of the setup and making sure everything looks good. Uh, And obviously with all of this, you know, we've talked about what to wear and looking professional and all of that, you know, is important too. But really most you know, of these interviews are sort of kind of to get to know you. Mm -hmm. Um, So it should be stuff that in theory, you'd be comfortable with. Right. We've even got uh, episode 190, which is about passing the important but unstated interview happy hour test. So if you don't know what we're talking about, go and listen to that one. But I do think, you know, interviews are an opportunity to see you beyond just that page of your resume and the transcript. So it can be an opportunity. And I think looking at it that way, And again, like you said, being prepared, but not scripted, I think it's a hard balance. But you know, if there are weird things on your resume that you're sure people are going to ask about, you want to have a storyline that you can just tell them. I mean, but you got to make it sound like, you know, they might be the first person who ever asked you about this obviously weird thing. (laughs) Exactly. And keep these short stories short. Definitely. (laughs) Is the other thing. I think some people go into every detail when they're telling things. So that's a good reason to practice. Yeah, definitely. You can even time yourself. You should not be talking for more than a couple of minutes. All right. Moving on to everyone's next favorite topic, which law students just love, the big N-word, networking. So... We have episode 114 on Law School Networking 101. 
We've got 207 on navigating networking events as a law student. As I recall this one, we even talk about, you know, how to hold a wine glass and shake hands and eat. Um, And 125 on maintaining a professional profile in the digital age, which is probably even more important now. So what are some, you know, the basics of networking that people need to be thinking about? Well, one, I think it can be awkward, especially, you know, the kind of cocktail party situations, you know, they can feel kind of forced. So I think, you know, you sort of have to go into it knowing that it may be awkward. Um, And I think, you know, you sort of do your best to chit chat with people. And I think, you know, you need to remember that most people who, you know, you're trying to interact with probably want to help you. Um, So, you know, we talked about sort of reaching out to people and a lot of people going to these events are there, you know, because they honestly want, um, you know, to be part of, you know, bringing the next generation of lawyers in. Um, and so I think, you know, they just want to have a conversation with you. Right. Uh, and I don't, I think that you can kind of take some of the pressure off and try to just, you know, speak to everyone like you normally would. Yeah. If we ever get to go out and talk to people in public again. So we probably will be doing an episode soon about what to do for virtual networking, because that is kind of what we're living in right now. So, you know, in, in some epi- in some respects, actually, I don't think it was that long ago that we recorded about in 207 navigating networking events. Not so relevant right this minute. Um, but, you know, if you ever do find yourself needing to go to a cocktail party and needing to know how to hold that wine glass and your plate, check that one out. Um, planning for the future at some point. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I mean, I think there are some kind of networking Zoom situations now. Yeah. Um, you know, which would present their own challenges. Right. And you know, I think you know we'll probably do an episode about other ways to network um, and keep in touch with people. But I think the basics are the same. You know, assume assume people do kind of want to are interested in you and want to help you, and then give it an easy way for them to do that by you know telling them who you are and that kind of thing which leads directly into our next big topic which figuring out your story and what you actually want um so one of these episodes is 165 which is what is an elevator pitch which is exactly what you need uh for your networking events um and related to that is 166 which is kind of how to frame your job search story um And along with both of those, we have a couple of episodes from different people about owning your career and really taking ownership. So uh, one of those is 142 is with Whitney Beard, who is an ex-lawyer and career coach at Oric. And then you joined us for 224, which is about taking ownership of your career. So why do you think these things matter? I think this actually may be the most important part um, of the entire process because, you know, it's sort of what the story is that you're telling other people uh, about, you know, why you ended up in law school and where you want to go moving forward. And I think, um, you know, that can go way beyond just what a resume or a cover letter or your past job history, you know, says. I think that you have the power to sort of frame these things in a different way, you know, not just straight this, I did this and I did that. You know, you have the ability to tell them what all of this means and how, you know, it gets put together and, you know, why they should hire you. So I think this is actually really important to, you know, your process. And it's something that I don't know that a lot of law students really spend much time on. I think that's right. And I think it is really what makes all these other pieces fit. Because if you have a clear narrative about what you've done in the past and how that relates to what you want to do in the future, and you're really clear about what you want to do, then the resume and cover letter becomes easy then the interview is pretty easy, you know, but if you don't have that, then you're just kind of floundering. So I think people do really want to spend some time on figuring out what they want and like why this makes sense for them um, before jumping into all the details of these other topics. So I think if you're not quite sure what you want, these are great ones to start with. Absolutely. And I think this is something an employer can tell, right. you know, that it's a cohesive story and it makes sense. And I think that employers can also tell when it seems like you've just been floating around and you don't really know why you ended up there. Right. I think that's something they can also see. Yeah, if you so have, just keep that in yeah, mind. Yeah, if you have nothing but public interest experience on your resume and suddenly you're applying for bankruptcy jobs and they're like, huh, 
how does that work? And yeah. not to say that you can't do it, but you definitely would need an answer. That is an interview question you would need to prep for. <laughs> exactly. Well, and I think, you know, this is a chance to kind of see the things that you're uncomfortable with, maybe, or you feel, you know, maybe a negative about your past and frame it in a different way mm -hmm. for an employer. Yeah, because it's all about the framing. You know, you can sell basically anything. I mean, I had to sell people on a transition from architecture, sociology to architecture to programming to law. And, you know, I told a good story. They bought it. Um, <laughs> but I had to work on that one. Um all right, well, let's switch gears a little bit before we run out of time and talk through a few individual episodes that we like for varying reasons. I think some of these are kind of fun or they address specific problems um, that we get a lot of questions about. So one I think people should be interested in is 126, which is how to get people to help you with your job search. So we hear this question a lot, right? Absolutely. And I think this is very relevant to the current situation, um, you know, that you're maybe not able to see people in person, you need to be reaching out to various people um, in sort of, you know, not the typical ways. Um, but I do think that, you know, my big takeaway from this was what we discussed earlier, that people want to help you. Right. Um, and so if you make it easy for them to help you, they will. <laughs> so I think what we really talked about was kind of coming to them, you know, telling them what exactly you're looking for, and um, making sure that you follow up with anyone that they put you in touch with. Um, you sort of close the loop. You make it clear that you're really on top of your stuff. Uh, but I think ultimately most people do want to help people. Right. They just need to sort of be assisted in that process to know what would be most helpful because otherwise they might be running around doing all kinds of unhelpful things. So this is a great one to focus on if you, you know, want some help and you are willing to ask for help and you want people to be able to help you effectively, go listen to that. Um, all right. Next up, uh, it's kind of a pair of episodes, which I think were quite fun. Um, 124, which is don't be a jerk at work. And 188, which is how to make people hate you at work. Um, so <laughs> these are kind of fun episodes, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone goes into any job wanting to be the hated person or, you know, the person that develops a reputation right away. But there do seem to be people that fit into these categories. So I think we just kind of went over, you know, some of the top things we've seen that really put people off, you know, in a work environment. And, you know, a lot of it seems like common sense, but people make mistakes um, and so sort of treating everyone with respect and, you know, being aware of your time management, not leaving people in the lurch. Um, you know, I think we talked about treating support staff well. I think that's mm -hmm. really important. Definitely. Yeah. So if you're not sure if you are, you know, going to be a A plus employee and maybe you think you might have some personality issues or some tendencies towards doing things that people might not like, these are great episodes to go and check out. Uh, because you do not want to be that person that no one wants to work with because that's not going to be great for your career. And it can be something where if you start that way, it can be really hard to get out of, right. you know, that reputation. And so don't don't start that way. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> because people will remember. Um, it's just like law, law school. You know, you still remember those people, 1L classes that behaved like a jerk. That's just the way it is. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, next episode that's pretty fun uh, is 132, where we talk about what big law is really like, because I think a lot of people have a very strong misconception about what they're getting into. And you worked at a lot of firms. I worked at a number of firms. You know, there are differences, but there also are consistencies. Absolutely. And, you know, I think a lot of people think of big law as sort of the dream or the ultimate job. And if they get that job, you know, they've sort of won a prize. And then some people get there and they realize, you know, that it's not what they expected. And so I think it's important to kind of understand the hierarchy of the firm and kind of, you know, I think some of the sort of personality um things can be consistent throughout firms, um, sort of the type of people that are drawn to, you know, big law and cer even certain practice areas kind of can be consistent. Um, and, and I think, you know, a certain type of person 
survives there and thrives there and does well. And so it's good to kind of understand that going into it before you just get on a path because you think it's the best place to end up or, you, right. or you'll make the most money. Right. Yeah, there's there's more to life than prestige. But I think people who are happier, you know, generally speaking, have a better idea of what they're signing up for. So if you want to know what you're signing up for, go listen to episode 132. All right. A recent one we did uh, based on a ton of questions uh, we always get is 234, which is how will transferring law schools impact the job search? I think people have a lot of misconceptions around this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, And I think the takeaway was, you know, if you're transferring up, which is really the main reason that people are transferring, it's generally going to be looked at positively. I think people sort of worry about, you know, change and, and if it, however it looks for, you know, future employers. But I think, you know, it's always a positive that you did well your first year and you can transfer to someone or somewhere that's much higher ranked. Um, You know, there are other reasons that people transfer if it's a location issue, personal issue, you know, it's something you can explain to. But generally, um, I've always seen it, you know, looked upon pretty favorably. I agree. And I think that's one of the things one of our takeaways there is, you know, if you're if you have a lot of angst about how this is going to look, don't have that angst because it's going to be fine. Um, All right. Next up, another topic we get a lot of questions about is what to do as a non-traditional law student. So people, again, have a lot of angst around like, well, I had this other career or I took time off or I did these other things. Is that going to hurt me when I'm applying for jobs? So 205 is about navigating interviews as a non-traditional law student. And again, I think generally speaking, this is a plus. Absolutely. And I was thinking about it. Um, it almost seems like the non-traditional is now more traditional right. because it's less <laughs> likely that you went straight through, which used to be the norm. Right. Um, so things have sort of switched. I've seen more um, employers saying, oh, they went straight through. I don't know if they're, you know, have enough experience. Right, are they or mature, mature enough? enough. Like yeah. you put them in front of a client, that kind of thing. Exactly. So I think the key here is to not get stuck on things that you may feel like are going to be interpreted negatively because a lot of times they're not going to be interpreted negatively. But if you go in with that mindset, that's going to come out. So it's sort of getting comfortable with your background. And like we talked about before your story and then using all these as an advantage to sell yourself. Mm -hmm, Because you have more material to work with. But again, you've got to kind of frame it for them and make them think that it makes sense and that it is a benefit. And then I think, you know, it's going to be fine. Um, another topic we get a ton of questions about, and there's a lot of angst around, um, is navigate or sorry, is negotiating offers. Um, and so this is, we talked about in episode 181. I mean, I think there's a little bit less of an issue in law because most, you know, a lot of the offers people are getting are these kind of standard, you know, do you want to be a summer associate or not type of things, but there are you know tons of jobs outside of that. So I think this is a useful episode, uh, for people. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we talked about, you know, there are some things that you can negotiate, there are some things that are set, um, you know, and if it is like big law or something that's on, you know, a set salary scale, you're not going to have much room there. Um, But there, you know, there may be other things to negotiate, um, transferring between offices or, you know, remote work or other things. Um, And just generally with job offers, you know, I think it's making sure that you you know what you're asking for, you know, what you're willing to take um, and sort of that balance between not overreaching and not underreaching, kind of finding that sweet spot. Mm-hmm. Which I think can be intimidating for people. So go check out 181. Um, all right. Another topic that I think is, you know, on everyone's minds is about How do you handle an extensive job search kind of outside of this OCI process and maintain your sanity? So we talked about that in 214. And, you know, this is, I think, is a pretty relevant episode. Definitely. Um, I think a key takeaway from this is that most people don't get jobs through OCI. Right. And so I think sometimes you could be caught in your small circle where maybe they all did get jobs through OCI and you don't really know in the big picture that most people don't. Um, so there are lots of opportunities, you know, to find jobs through other means. I think it's maybe more work. 
um, OCI is sort of this thing that's set out for you. Right, and like, here you, you go. just follow their process. <laughs> exactly. And at the end of the road, there's a job. Um, and so that's great for some people and it's definitely easier, but I actually think that you develop more long-term skills doing a real job search because that's, what's going to happen, you know, after OCI, you're never going to be in that situation again. Um, so I think, you know, it's all possible is definitely not the end of the world. If at the end of OCI, you don't have a set job offer, there's, there's tons of other ways to do it. You just need to put a little more thought and work into it. Right. And, you know, most people don't last very long in these big law jobs anyway. So it'll be good if you have these skills already. Exactly. Well, we're about out of time, but finally, we would be remiss, I think, not to mention this very recent episode we did, episode 239, where we really were looking to history to assess the impact of COVID-19 on the legal job market. So I think this is a great episode because it's actually amazing how much amnesia current law Mm -hmm. students seem to have around what happened pretty recently, right? Absolutely. Or, you know, depending on, you know, their age, they just really weren't, um, you know, adults then. So they maybe didn't understand the full, you know, scale of what happened. I also know people that were at firms then and don't really remember. (laughs) Um, Right. So I agree. 2008. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, over 10 years ago at this point, although it took quite a few years to come back from that. And so that's something to remember, too. You know, it's not an immediate turnaround. um, It's sort of a process. Um, And usually there's there's a reassessment at the end of that in terms of kind of how you do things. Uh, And so I think, you know, we can learn a lot. This is a slightly different situation. Um, it's sort of on multiple fronts, uh, cause you also have the challenge of not being able to meet people in person and just certain things that need to be done, you know, a, a specific way, but the economic side, I think, uh, definitely we can, we can take things from that and we can remember that, you know, law firms had to do a lot to survive, you know, the 2008 recession and, you know, most of the firms did. So right. hopefully they learn something that, you know, they can implement now. Right. And I think a lot of them are implementing changes pretty quickly. So it's definitely if you are thinking that you're going to work at a firm, I think you definitely want to be aware of history and also be aware of really what's happening almost on a day to day basis. And a lot, I mean, this is all being reported typically in the media, so you can go find out. But you do want to make sure, you know, that you're signing up for a firm that you feel comfortable with the actions they're taking and that kind of thing. And I also um, think we, you know, we talked about just kind of assessing what what direction you want your career to go. Um, and this is the time to maybe make some changes. And that's, that's fine. Right, exactly. And opportunities may or may not be presenting themselves. And that's just kind of the reality of it. Um, so go check that out. If you're not clear what we're talking about, there's a lot you can learn from recent history. Um, before we wrap up, we also have a ton of different interviews with lawyers and ex-lawyers about their career paths. So if you're looking for different ideas, you can go check those out. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a single page on the podcast archive just for career topics. We will link to that. Um, but there's a lot of interesting conversations we've had with different people about kind of their path. And I think when you listen to those, you definitely hear, you know, that people's careers did not necessarily turn out exactly the way they thought they might as a 1L and that they're totally okay with that. Absolutely. All right. Well, with that, um, we hope you enjoyed this wrap up. We are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us and for listening over the years. And thank you to Sadie for joining us on so many great episodes and also on this recap episode. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. My pleasure. Well, for more career help and the opportunity to work one-on-one with us, you can check out careerdicta.com. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon.